The PlayStation 2 was my favorite console of its generation, and it was the one I put by far the most time into. I liked my GameCube, and technically my brother owned an Xbox and it wasn't one that I had full access to, but I did still use it on occasion. But the PlayStation 2 was the one that I always defaulted to. It had the biggest library and it was the one we got first in our household. It was my introduction to this entire generation of consoles, and it was the one we always kept set up until the 360 stole its place by the TV many years later. This was a console that defined an entire chapter of my life, but it was also the worst time of my life to have such a monumental system define it. When I got access to the PlayStation 2, I was 7 years old, and by the time the next generation rolled around, I was 12. Being that young, combined with the fact that I was the youngest in a family with four older brothers who were all teenagers or young adults during this time, this meant that I was in an age where I wanted to be seen as cool and mature, but I was too young to understand what that meant and my tastes weren't properly developed. When I look back on the PlayStation 2, I think of games like Grand Theft Auto Vice City, Destroy All Humans, and even that weird Playboy sim game where I really liked it except for all those naked ladies which made me feel weird. I ignored the more child-friendly games of the era, which is consequently what the system is probably best known for. I didn't play Ratchet and Clank, Sly Cooper, or today's topic Jack and Daxter on this console. If I did go in for more family-friendly games, it was from established series I liked, which meant I played Wrath of Cortex, and to the Dragonfly, and the Simpsons skateboarding. And perhaps that is what rewired my brain to like more mature games, because coincidentally, I played good ones of those and bad ones that weren't. As a result of this, I look back on the PlayStation 2 as a generic console. A nice vanilla one that got a lot of cross-platform support, but it had very few exclusives. And I know that's not what the system actually was, I just have no attachment to the real exclusives, unless they were for the iToy, obviously. I deeply regret my choices at this age, but frankly not playing Sly Cooper at the age of 9 isn't super high on my list of life regrets. Thankfully, during my young adult years, Sony answered my prayers, and seemingly only my prayers, as they released the PlayStation Vita, a system I bought twice in my life, so I'm personally responsible for a large percentage of the Vita sales. The Vita was a lot of things, and while many of those have the word failure in there, to me it was a second chance at experiencing the PlayStation back catalogue. It's how I first experienced many classic games, like the old Metal Gear Solid titles, Ratchet and Clank, Sly Cooper, and these were all wonderful conversions. I have no reservations about recommending any of these games on the Vita. But there was another PlayStation 2 icon I didn't just mention, and that was Jack and Daxter. Until recently, I personally avoided it, because I heard nothing but bad things about the Vita port. I owned it, but it just sat on the shelf next to the Vita games I refused to look at because they'll put me on a watch list. But then, I remembered I have no standards, and my eyes are probably broken so why not give it a go. The main problem people point out with the Vita port of Jack and Daxter is the frame rate is unbearable, and to the people actually watching the footage on screen at the moment, I'm sure you'll probably agree. This isn't YouTube doing the game poorly, this is just how it runs. I'm not going to say this isn't an issue to a lot of people, but to me personally, it isn't. I would still recommend to anyone other than me to go play this game in any of its other incarnations. And to those people, like me, who don't actually have a PlayStation Home console set up, this game is very easy to emulate on a computer. Hypothetically speaking, just saying it is an option out there, and for all the police listening, I did not actually do that. Nor did I do that with the footage I used at the beginning of this video. Growing up, I played games at a much lower frame rate. PAL Nintendo 64 games probably broke my ability to properly judge things like this, and it wasn't helped when I used to play World of Warcraft in the 2000s on a computer that couldn't even get it past 15 frames per second. This isn't me trying to flex or anything, I don't even think it's that cool an ability, this is one of the lamest X-Men powers out there. I just personally don't have the ability to pick up on most subpar frame rates. And even when I can, like when it's below 10 frames a second, I don't necessarily mind it because it was good enough for me in those instances. Put me in front of a flipbook and I'll lose my goddamn mind. I bring this up because Jack and Daxter on the Vita runs at 20 frames a second and it does still stutter. 
If this is a problem for you, and it almost certainly will be, like I said, please play this game through any other means. Even overclocking a Vita won't fix this, but it does still make it a little more stable in case this is your only option or you're desperate to get trophies. Much like the Vita itself, this port was made for me and only for me. Regardless of your console of choice and the accompanying performance, this game opens up to two elf-like characters whose designs I dislike going somewhere they shouldn't named for Misty Islands. And then one of these ugly characters is magically transformed into a better design, but his personality is annoying enough to mitigate that praise. These are our two characters, Jack and Daxter. Jack is silent, and Daxter is anything but. Imagine Ratchet and Clank with no charisma, and designs ripped off early 2000s deviant art. And this is our duo. And while it may sound like I hate them, I really don't. They are unique and instantly recognisable, and very much a product of the time which I do like. These are designs I do enjoy, but they are still kind of ugly, and they definitely drew the short straw for mascot duos of that generation. It would be reductive to say I dislike them, but I wouldn't admit to being big fans of these designs either, but they do still win me over just on the sheer early 2000s-ness of it. We're also introduced to the two main side characters of the game shortly after this. We have the Sage Samus, who has a more appealing and rounded design, going for an eccentric look while still carrying the traits of Jack species. In fact, a lot of townspeople you do missions for, and the other sages, have similar designs and I do like the look of his species. I just like it more when it's heavily exaggerated and doesn't look like a human teenager from 2001 in cosplay. And that brings us to Kira. She is basically just that, but her design is even worse than Jack's once you get below the neck. And both Jack and Kira have prominent toes on display, so get used to that. During this whole opening section, one of the most insidious parts of the game displays itself. We have no subtitles. It doesn't matter if it's in cutscenes, character dialogue, or receiving objectives, nothing is displayed on screen. While this could almost be forgiven in its original release, as accessibility options weren't as established in 2001, even if subtitles themselves were pretty standard by this time, it is completely unforgivable in this remake for PS3 and Vita, which came out in the 2010s. I'm sure this was a product of rush development and not deliberate to screw over a chunk of their audience, but it still needs to be said. My ability to process what I hear isn't as sharp as I'd like it to be, especially in a game where a lot of characters have silly, exaggerated voices, and on occasion I did miss some things. One of the villains even has a voice that I found very difficult to understand due to the amount of filters in place. Thankfully, my hearing isn't the worst, and I was able to get through with no real hardships, but to those players out there with more significant hearing impairments, this game's story turns into an incomprehensible mess, and characters asking you to do things won't register with you until you specifically check the objectives list in the pause screen after that dialogue. For the consideration of players out there who would like a transcript of this game's dialogue, a link to one is included in the description. I've been really negative about this game, and in some far distant future where my videos actually get views, I'm kind of expecting a comment or two to be from people who didn't make it this far, that just say they hated my complaining. And that's fine, even if it does make me sad. I genuinely did not like this game for the first hour or two, but a lot of that was due to circumstances including everything I mentioned, and the other things like the game not being what I expected it to be. But with all that said, I fell in love. Okay, that's a stretch. But I fell into really liking Jack and Daxter. It is no Sly Cooper, but I'd go as far to say I found this more enjoyable than the first Ratchet and Clank game, even if I am playing it at two thirds the frame rate. I still do hate the design of a protagonist, but as a game, I do love it. This isn't the linear 3D platformer I expected and honestly wanted at first, nor was it a 3D collectathon with segmented levels and a hub world integrating them all. This 3D platformer is a series of interconnected levels that feel like they seamlessly transition from one to another. This might sound obvious to virtually everyone who was aware of this game, but I knew nothing going into it, and what I assumed for decades was almost instantly proven wrong. 
The opening village leads into accompanying beaches and jungles, and while there are aesthetic changes, the game doesn't signpost that the level changes, or make it feel too obvious for the most part. To put it in terms my preteen self would understand, this is more like a Tony Hawk's Project 8 on next generation consoles, where everything bleeds into each other, instead of a Tony Hawk's American Wasteland, where you have tunnels to mask loading. Although there are tunnels of sorts here, but they serve a different purpose and add variety to the gameplay, more on that later. In Jack and Daxter, we're tasked with collecting precursor orbs and power cells, relics of a previous civilization, and these are needed to bypass level gates. Basically this game's version of stars or jiggy pieces, but they're integrated into the setting in a much more interesting way instead of just being simple magic. These are basically fuel to activate precursor technology, which is required to cross insurmountable gaps that can't just be walked across. Precursor orbs are basically the coin substitute, and these are usually just traded to various characters in exchange for power cells. I like the use of this quite a bit, even if bartering for your magical MacGuffin does sound like a lazy way of padding, especially when it is so constant here. But instead of having to collect 100% of these orbs in a single level, we have a running total across every level, and you're rewarded on casual runs when you're not going for everything. And these orbs will remain collected no matter how many times you die, so this isn't a situation where you need to perfect your runs. It's a very encouraging way to make sure even the youngest or least skilled players out there can have some sense of progress. On that topic, death is almost meaningless here. There are no lives, and upon death, whether that be from using all three of your hit points or falling into a pit, you're just teleported back to an earlier section with very frequent checkpoints. I'm very appreciative of this because while Jack and Daxter isn't a hard game by any means, it's far easier than the Crash Bandicoot trilogy previously developed by this team, this game does still have quirks that can lead to deaths that while still your fault will have you second guessing those moments where you'll want to lay blame on the game itself. The double jump is finicky and doesn't always work when you would expect it to. It is circumvented by properly learning for timing but new players, or those unfamiliar with what the game expects, may find themselves dying to what feels like no fault of their own. On top of that, the camera here is frankly terrible, and often gets stuck on objects or shows you angles that aren't the best for the moment. The camera is still fully controllable, with the exception of it getting stuck on objects, and for the time, it wasn't especially terrible, but this is one of those factors that has not aged well at all. Early on when I was coming to grips with the game's mechanics, I hated dying mostly just because I meant Daxter would pop up on the screen and say what he thought was a funny quip. And getting better at the game was a rewarding experience, just because it meant I saw less of him. That was more important than actually getting better at the game. The basic controls are quite simple, and I do love them, double jump issues notwithstanding. It's not very surprising, but our jump can be modified with a few different options, most notably a high jump and a long jump, which are pretty standard, but I do love the spin jump here. After jumping, you can use the circle button, which is used for one of your attacks, but while in the air, this will slightly slow your fall, which can help you reach certain platforms. It is a simple but elegant way of expanding the repertoire here. All the moves here feel suitably appropriate for multiple different moments, but the game is happy for you to spam your spinning attack, which is a nice welcome. This game has beat-em-up elements, but first and foremost this is a children's platformer, so I'm glad they didn't overstep the complexity in terms of ease of access for the core demographic. A more original skill, and one that I wholeheartedly love here, is the Echo Abilities. These are temporary power-ups we can equip by walking over these vents. The blue echo, for example, temporarily increases Jack's speed and attracts objects towards him. But most importantly, it can activate dormant precursor technology, including doors that can't be opened otherwise. This turns the game momentarily into a quick sprint from one area to another, where you'll have to reach the goal before the energy expires. This isn't much, but the game puts it to great use, and it comes back enough times to feel like an integral part of the design, rather than just a short diversion. This allows the game to ramp up what is required of the player in isolated instances that don't overstay their welcome. The Yellow Echo gives you the temporary ability to shoot projectiles, which is fun for more effortlessly killing enemies, but it also puts the game's first person mode to great use. And the Red Echo exists just to make you more powerful for a limited time, 
and you know, it has the least utility, but it's still fun. I mean, I have no problem with her being here. It's just the middle child of this family. And while Echo ranges in utility quite a lot, the inclusion really helps sell the precursor legacy the game is on about. This game really goes for the fact that this is a society built on top of one that has passed, with my favourite examples being levels dedicated to this concept, like an abandoned underwater city or the final section of this game's story. But no matter where you go, you can't escape reminders of a long gone but not forgotten world. Ruins are everywhere and their vehicles are crucial to Jack and Dexter's journey. While this game is seamlessly open most of the time, it does still have occasional tunnels to mask technical issues, and more importantly, properly segment the game. These are the level gates I mentioned earlier, but they're in the form of vehicle sections down long hallways. These were actually fantastic inclusions and some of my favourite moments in the entire game. They spiced up the gameplay in the same way as the Echo, and provided fun challenges like completing a race, or getting through a long section without the vehicle overheating. Best of all, these tunnels are mini-levels with their own collectibles and challenges, so they don't just feel like a one-and-done diversion, these are levels in their own right, just ones different from the majority. And I especially appreciated these long hallways where you can't get lost, after getting lost in some of the game's other levels. Just to preface this, most of the levels are fantastic to explore for the first time, and they have great signposting throughout with visible landmarks to help keep my mental map going, and others are so linear anyway that you can't get lost. And at worst, you just lose your orientation in a single room until you realise a few seconds later which wall you're looking at. To me, particular highlights were Boggy Swamp and the Lost Precursor City, where everything felt laid out and segmented perfectly. But, some levels like the Spider Cave, and even the final level, saw me getting turned around quite a few times, things looked a bit too samey in those levels, and I did lose my bearing easily, especially during the Spider Cave. Even one of my favourite levels, the Snowy Mountain, had a few moments where my sense of direction proved to be terrible, but despite getting lost on occasion, the game never stopped being enjoyable, from the opening levels to the multi-stage final boss. The levels of the game proved to be immersive, even with any shortcomings I personally had. The day-night cycle was an excellent touch that kept the world feeling alive. The immersion was so grand I almost forgot the Vita's port still left in the vibration function, even though this handheld can't vibrate. Whoops. But hey, at least they took out the colours of the face buttons just to match the Vita's face buttons. They clearly picked their priorities with this port. Speaking of priorities, it clearly wasn't on the music. It's alright in the moment, it's nice and atmospheric, but it's nothing that will stick with me. But the same cannot be said for the visuals. Sure, some character designs I didn't personally like, but this is a beautiful and inviting world, with enemy and NPC designs that are memorable, filled with bright colours and natural landscapes with old elements of this bygone society littered across the world. And the lack of loading screens between everything made this a very cohesive, colourful, and personal favourite map of mine. When it comes to mascot platformers of the era, the map here is hard to top. But as a whole, this first Jack and Daxter game, while still a great experience and one I wish I played sooner, is not one that will be dethroning my favourite platformers of all time. But it was still wonderful and proved to me Naughty Dog was not a one-trick pony, since I have somehow never played a non-Crash Bandicoot game of theirs until now. Jack and Daxter isn't on par with the Bandicoot's best, but it's still much better than the majority of his output, and I can easily see why this is a nostalgic favourite to an entire generation of people, even through the lens of this less-than-perfect Vita port.